Hey everybody, welcome back to this percussion hang on World Drum Club. I'm Kalani, as you know, and I'm so pleased to be able to welcome a friend, a colleague, an amazing person and percussionist to this hang, MB Gordy. Thanks, MB, for being here. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. and it's nice to have another guy that we kind of looks like me because you know we need more. <laughs> I know we go to the same barber. <laughs> we need more of that, but I got some catching up to do here. I got it. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I figure I can't grow it up here, so I'll, I'll, I'll I can do it down there. <laughs> That's right. That's right. When people say, "Oh, so you're bald," and I'm like, "Well, only up here." Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> yes. you haven't seen the rest of. All right. <laughs> we are, we've already digressed, but yeah, thank you so much. Uh, for those of you who don't know, MB is a LA based. Well, now you're LA based. You've been all over, but a percussionist, drummer, musician, composer, uh, you know, and we're all producers these days, of course. And, you know, sort of have to. be. Yeah, yeah you kind of have to at least as percussionists, we have to self produce all the time also because we're communicating with, you know, with composers and producers who may not know what we do. Actually, that would be a good launching question. So, MB, can you talk about a little bit just, you know, about what's going on in general? Uh, and maybe a little bit about your background, but then I want to get into that question of kind of helping, helping other people who don't know what we do, kind of figure out what we do. Like, how do we you know, uh, communicate? Yeah. Uh, hey, I, I just want to do one thing. I want to put you on speaker. Oh, I see. It goes like that. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So, um, well, let's see. Uh, uh, where do I start? Uh, I'll give you uh, just a I'll try to do the reader's guide. If I get, if I digress at all, which I usually will and do, uh, please rein me back in. But uh, I'll, so real quick, I'll do the reader's digest version of, of I start, you know, played music in high school, played drums only. I, I mean, I regret to this day still that I didn't have a piano or really a piano background like a lot of people had or get, you know, but because um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a really great foundation for everything. But anyway, so that's it. So I that played drums and then, you know, went to a, a graduate school. I mean, I'm sorry, undergraduate school in, in Towson, Maryland called Towson State um, uh, in, Balt in just outside of Baltimore and uh, left there, uh, lived at home for a little bit, went to Salisbury State College, which became Salisbury University, and then did some traveling, eventually went to school in New Jersey at Glassboro State. Um, which uh, that now over the years has become Rowan University. It's a it's black in fact. I went back there a couple of years ago when I was on tour with Game of Thrones live and did a workshop or, you know, a sort of sat in with a big band and did a little workshop and stuff. That town is like completely different now. It's like, it's like a whole, the whole town is the university. It's amazing. I, not like that when I was there, but anyway, so that's that. And then I went to graduate school at Cal Arts, uh, California Institute of the Arts up in Valencia. Um, where I got way, way, way more into world music. I mean, I kind of got into it early. I mean, when I was in undergraduate school through, uh, I'm sure, Kalani, you know, uh, the Paul Winter Consort. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if Roseanne, Mark, you guys know that group. Uh, but I'm, actually, Paul Winter is still around doing his thing. He's got to be... <laughs> I don't know what 90 years old i mean it's, it's amazing yeah. it's amazing yeah um and i always loved him i loved his band and he had this percussionist named colin walcott who you know the he's passed away now but colin was the first person that i heard in that setting play tabla and i was like oh i i got it i gotta do that so mm -hmm. i get this uh, brilliant idea that i'm gonna go <laughs> get my own tabla somewhere and get a book and learn how to play tabla doesn't mm. quite work that way when you learn tabla so um <laughs> anyway so fast forward when i went to graduate school i i kept pursuing that because the teacher my, te my teacher and mentor there was a gentleman who's now again passed away as well but uh by the name of john bergamo and um he was a he's a master of anything he ever touched i mean he's ridiculous and um so I started studying tabla with him, but then a gentleman, they were waiting for the, the tabla, actual Indian guy that's when they come, and his name was Taranath Rao. So that's who I studied tabla with, ultimately, when, when ta Taranath showed up. And I actually ended up living next door to him. So that was a trip, because it was basically lesson time any anytime you went over there. And if you happen to be at Taranath's, or near, just near the apartment, 
at lunchtime, you better be staying for lunch. <laughs> it was always like, that was like, you know, it's like that Indian kind of mentor thing. It's like, no, you're, yeah. you're hanging with us now. You're, you're going to come in and you're going to eat. It was like a, always a thing. So I had to be very judicious and careful about when I, <laughs> when I stopped back at my apartment, because, you know, later on as a student, you know, it's like, I got to get to class, man. I can't, I can't, I can't just hang all afternoon. I mean, it was, I'd love to, but anyway, um, but it was great. It was a really great experience at Cal Arts. And that's where I really got kind of more and more. I did a lot of 20th century contemporary avant-garde stuff there as well. They didn't have a jazz program at Cal Arts when I was there. So mm-hmm. any drum set playing I did on was on my any of us did was on our own. Mm-hmm. Um, it was they, it was all new music, contemporary, you know, all that 20th century now. 21st century type stuff. Um, but that's where I got into tabla. That's where I got into Balinese and, and, and Javanese gamelan. I studied there, that there as well. And I studied African music, but I'm very careful. And I advise everybody else to be very careful when you talk to someone and they, and they say, Oh, well, I, I play African music. Well, first of all, that's kind of BS because there's what 54 countries in Africa. <laughs> so you play music from 54 different countries. I kind of <laughs> highly doubt that, you know, you might know two, you might barely know one, you know what I mean? So there's, so you gotta be, bar- I just, you know, I specifically studied a way drumming, which is a tribe in Ghana. That's what I did. I didn't study there. I didn't study any music from Mali or you know, any other country in Africa. That's what now it's expanded a little bit through the te- through the guys who are teaching there now. But um, but still, it's still limited. I mean, you know, they're not still teaching music from uh, um, Mauritius, you know, which is which is uh, uh, Sega music. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that's that's a whole different thing. I didn't even know existed until like last year. So, so it's like a continual learning process. So real quick, so that's kind of like a quick background. Through that, I got into, um, I mean, I kind of knew about, you know, when I was growing up, I wanted to be in the Beatles, man. I was like, uh, you know, I want to be in a band, you know, whatever. And, um, and then it, you know, through education, I got into jazz and through education, I got into world music and through education, I, you know, played a lot of orchestral music as well and then um and then when i came here it was like oh there's the whole film music thing i never thought about that you know what i mean i mean you hear music on when i was growing up yeah we, we know music on tv all the time um and movies but you didn't think about that as like oh that's a gig you know i at least i didn't but uh so that's where i kind of got turned into that and that's and then that was the beginning of like Oh, and then, you know, so breaking into town, one thing that led to the next and led to the next. And, that, and, and as you well know, Kalani, and I think everybody would know or agree that what we do is um, it's really a networking thing. And then, I, you know, and I've come to realize not that if I if I hadn't thought about it, you know, growing up and coming through my career and whatnot, I've thought about it a lot in the last bunch of years, um, which is why do I do what I do? You know, I mean, I mean, which is in general, just playing music, not just a specific type, whether it's film music or I've had, you know, I played with the Doobie Brothers. and I've done a pretty wide, vast array of things, which has been awesome. And I, that's what I love. I love the variety. But it, but at any rate, why do I do that? And I finally realized that certainly through the pandemic, that I didn't get, and I have a, look, I have a studio at my house now. I've had it for a bunch of years. Um, I've collected a bunch of instruments. It's insane what, you know, the, the, the instrument list that, that I have now, um, as, and you know, like yourself, I mean, you know, but I didn't get it. I listen, and I'm fortunate that I have the studio, but I didn't get into music to sit in my room by myself all day long and do and play tracks for people. I got into music as a community, as a, as a communication form of communication, you're with people, you know, that's, that's why it's, it's, it's a collaborative thing, man. I mean, even though a collaborative in the sense that it's like energy wise collaborative, because, you know, like when you're playing, say in an orchestra or a group and you've got a designated part that you got to play, it's still collaborative in the sense that, you know, it's part of everything else that's going on around you, even if it's totally written out, orchestrated or whatnot. Now, when there's the improvisational elements 
coming into play as well. Like this new band that I'm, and I say new, we've been together five and a half years now, but we won a Grammy 2019. We'll see what happens when the nominations come out for the new record. The new record's really, name of the band is Opium Moon in any way. This is a more improvisatory type situation, even though we each have our own role for sure. But it's, that's why I got into playing music, man, is to, is to be with people. I don't, I, you know, I don't like being alone personally, but some people do. And, you know, mm -hmm. as composers, for any of any, anyone here in Kalani, you know, as a composer, you, you kind of need to spend time by yourself to, to, to do that world, you know, but people who only do that, you know, in the, the, the array of composers is vast in this world now. Um, it's very, it can be lonely and it can be very isolating. Yeah. Um, so I can kind of hang with that a little bit, but I really got to be, I got to be, in an, in an environment of people, you know, and creating music that way. That's, I, that's why I still play live and I'm not going to not do any of these things until either, <laughs> either I don't get hired or my body can't take it anymore or whatever, you know what I mean? Or I'm just too old to function, you know what I mean? But it's like, I don't, I, it's all part of the deal. I love recording. I totally love recording. It's a different process than playing live. And I totally love playing live. I know, and I'm sure you do too. Plenty of people who they, they just kind of got them. I don't care about that anymore. Or I don't, whatever. And I knew conversely, very close friends of mine who coming up through school, they could have care, they could care less about doing a recording session. You know, I love that. I love mm -hmm. the challenge of that. I love everything about it. And I love um, the process. There's a different process than playing live. Right. So um, let's see. Now, have I digressed yet? I think, I don't know. Did I answer that? That's a, that's a sort of a quick. I, I was just, if I could make a, an analogy as somebody who cooks and who also loves, you know, being around people, I would say recording is like being in the kitchen, right? K recording is cooking. Yeah. Yeah. Eating at the table is playing live, right? <laughs> it's like, that's the dinner part. I, oh, I love that. That's awesome. Okay. I'm going to use that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, thank you for that, that overview. I mean, yeah, that's, this is why, well, it's, it's great for me as a interviewer, because I don't, you know, you, 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 you're really inside, you just, you can go so many places on your own, which is awesome. Right. I, I would, I'm curious just to get your take on maybe, let me, let me ask you this. Uh, if you, if, if you, if, if I can't, I'm going to ask it and then you can just think about it. What was one of the, your favorite moments as a live performing musician and then what was one of your favorite moments or most intriguing moments in this, in the studio, like doing a session for somebody and just, mm -hmm. I know those are two separate things, but maybe just think about that for a second. Yeah. And uh, if there's something that pops out, uh, tell it's us about it. A bunch, and, but only because, and I say there's a few, uh, because they're different. Okay. Because these situations were different. And, I, and I'll mention one, which was, um, when I was playing with the Doobie Brothers, now you've toured, you know, with the people you've toured with Barry Manilow and and uh, and, and Yanni and all that. Um, so we all know. <laughs> if you don't, if your listeners don't know. There's a lot of drama that goes into all that world. You know what I mean? But um, and because they're the star, they're the artist. We're like the side guys, you know, like whatever. So the, the Doobie Brothers really was an awesome gig, but it was no different in that sense that, you know, like you had your place and that's what you had to fill. But at any yeah, rate, yeah. Um, so, uh, but one of the, the most incredible experiences that I ever had with that band, which were a lot, but uh, was uh, playing for the 100th anniversary of Harley, the Harley Fest that they called it uh, in Milwaukee. And that was, I, I want to say summer of 2004 um, for 275,000 people. That was nuts. Wow. Oh my God. <laughs> um, and I don't, I don't get nervous on these kinds of like the, this kind of thing. I'll, I, I might get a, have a little angst. Well, I might have some angst, but I mean, I'm going to definitely have a little more angst and maybe get a little more nervous when I have to perform re, re you know, written red music that you're, you're because it's got to be right on, man. You can't be making mistakes. Whereas when you do these other type gigs, like what you've done and, you know, the other world of what I do, you know, if, if something's a little different than you did it the night before, it's okay. No big deal. It's just part of the vibe, man. You know, like I think now mm -hmm. not everybody in that world thinks that way, you know, <laughs> you know 
plenty yeah. of artists who go like, no, 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 no. You need to play go gak, go go gak in that bar. <laughs> and the next bar is go gak, go gak, you know, whatever. And you better do it that same way every time. <laughs> now, that's a little crazy making to me, but that, but I've learned more and more that, that, you know, that's just, that's your gig. That's your part, yeah. you know? So yeah. anyway, but anyway, so I don't really get nervous though when I, in those types of settings once in a while. But when that scrim went up on that massive stage and I looked out and saw a sea of 270,000 people, I was like, oh, uh, I was like a deer in the headlights, man. I was like, I I, I just went like, because I, I, all I could think of was like, wait a minute, I'm going to be on a big jumbotron somewhere. And there were like three or four deep, you know what I mean, for that crowd of people. And I'm going like, oh, my God, I got to look like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> so I was that was so that was a that was a very great experience on that gig. You, and then but the um, thing that the thing that that is good is you already look like about 80 percent of the Harley riders out there. So you got that going for you. Yeah, but man, if you'd have been at that game, you would have, you, boy, I felt like crazy. compared to it, it was I nuts. mean, an average, average stadium is what, 70,000? Yeah. I don't know. Lucky. A, a, right? A sporting, a sporting stadium. Yeah. And that's like five, five times that or something. That's nuts. It was crazy on so many levels. But anyway, so that was Four times. It, yeah. like another live situation, which completely different was, uh, and I, I would say, Oh man, I've been so lucky to have just a, a bunch of different ones, man. Because they're all special, you know what I mean. Particularly when you're yeah. when it's that getting getting into that thing that I'm talking about when you're really communicating with this whatever environment it is you're in, whether it's a quintet or a trio or an orchestra, you know, whatever. So I did this gig. Actually, this this was the summer right before I played. I got this in 2001 before I got the gig with the Doobie Brothers. <clears throat> uh, Simon Rattle came to town. You, I don't know if your guests know who he is, but he's a he's a conductor and uh, just incredible and classy dude, long, curly gray hair. I mean, you, I'm already jealous of that because you had hair. But anyway, <laughs> and just style and just an amazing conductor. And he's a percussionist. I never knew that until I met him and worked with him. And so anyway, so I was playing with the L.A. Phil. Uh, new music group and we were getting ready to pr prepare this there's a there's a festival out here is i don't know are your listeners here in california david mark and Roseanne so far you in, you're not in california okay okay awesome okay well so there's a town in the hills up north of here called ojai between here and, and santa barbara and um uh so they have this thing called the ojai music festival every year now pandemic things changed but anyway they actually had it again this year so we were getting ready to rehearse for that we were doing this thing piece by this guy british composer and the band was a small cham chamber orchestra peter erskine was playing drums i mean i was one of the percussion section uh peter erskine was playing drums dave carpenter was playing bass uh mm. I, mike stern was playing guitar i mean it was wow this was an insane thing Mark Anthony Turnage. I just remembered his name. Uh, anyway, that was a composer. So it was this 12 movement piece. 72 minutes long. That was the concert. That was the piece we were presenting. No, I don't think we did any other music. No, I think that was it. Maybe we might have done one, one other piece. But anyway, and it was hard music. And that, that was a piece where like a piece you're, you're going to go like, OK, I got to practice a lot. And I'm going to I might get a little nervous here because I got to play this right, you know, whatever. Um, so we're conducting we're rehearsing at one point and some woman was sitting up by the by him in the front, you know, and she turns out she was the one of the head. She was big, a big wig with the orchestra on the board of directors or something. Anyway, so he's conducting and then Mark was there, too, and he comes up and he starts talking to him. Now, this is a piece of music that, you know, barely stayed in any given time signature for more than two or four bars at a time. It was like that, you know, whatever, <laughs> nonstop for 20 for 72 minutes. Right. <laughs> so at one point, the conduct the composer, he's conducting like this and he's not even looking at the music or bear and listening to notes that he's giving him while he's conducting. And he's just like, like this, just like, and we all almost stopped playing. I'm like, what is happening here, man? How do you do that? I mean, this was, this guy was ridiculous. Simon Rattle. I am a 
total fan of. He th- That might be, I've said this before, and I still agree, even after all these years, that might be one of the highest musical experiences of my life, mm. working with that guy. It was just amazing. I've never seen anything yeah. like it. And he would, and he's a sweetheart. He wasn't like, you know, like a conductors in that world, less so over the years now, but, but you still hear stories of these people who are just nightmares. You know, they just big egos, big, whatever. And uh, because, Hey, they're who they are conducting this massive, lot of pressure, you know, but whatever that happens, but yeah. um, he was unbelievable. So fast forward, literally that was June of 2001. July of 2001, I got the gig playing with the Doobie Brothers. So 9-11 happens, and we all know about that. Uh, then we actually went to Japan with the Doobies in October of that year after, you know, so after 9-11. So it was a mess, and you know, I mean, in terms of travel at this point because of security and everything. So we're in Japan, we're leaving Tokyo, and I'm at the airport, and there's a line, and this woman comes out with a sign and says, you, if you're on any of these flights, you need to get jump the line and you need to get through security now because security was a mess there. It was mm-hmm. a mess everywhere. <clears throat> so we all jump out of line and this guy walks in front of me. Now, this is October, right? So I worked with, with Simon Rattle in July, in June. And in the meantime, he'd, all, he'd been traveling around the world, working with orchestras. God knows how many people this guy's come in contact with. I see this dude walk in front of me and I was like, what? I go, Simon? And he turns around and he goes, I can't do the fake British accent, but I'll do it anyway. He goes, MB, what are you doing here, mate? And, he, and I'm like, what? You actually remembered my name? And I'm like, I'm like, good God, dude. I don't even know how you do that. He's probably met 10,000 people between the time, you know, like, I mean, it's insane. So anyway, that that's on the side of that story. But anyway, working with him was awesome. But then I was like, how do you even remember that? And this is why he is who he is. Because then you go like, oh, wait a minute. Of course he could do this when he's conducting. Because he's got this insane brain that yeah. it's, I guess, maybe even photographic. I don't know. But he, that, that's the way his brain works. You know what I mean? That was just blew my mind. You know, he'd probably remember me now if I bumped into him somewhere. I, I, mean, it's like, I don't know why. but I think. You know, I, I know some amazing musicians, too, that you where you're just kind of blown away. And I think a big part of it, and that makes me jealous, too, is that I think some people have excellent memories, you know, not just a capacity yeah, to think and to be creative and be musical, but to remember all this stuff and remember it, it's really helpful. I don't have that kind of memory, which is one reason I, <laughs> I, I tend I to. Wish, I mean, it's weird. Sometimes I think right? I do. And then. You know, I'll like, I'll bump into this. Oh, this happened to the the other day. I was doing a session. And of course, now wearing masks is a bummer because I can't tell anybody if I don't know them that well. I mean, if if somebody saw you or me, they go like, oh, the ball go, oh, hey, Kalani, oh, hey, Amby. They kind of remember. But there's this guy, he's an assistant to Lily, who's the violinist in our band. He did, he's just working for her a little less now. But anyway, I've worked with him two, two, three, four times. So anyway, I'm at the studio and he, <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he's there's this guy standing there as I'm packing up with the mask on and he's just kind of staring at me and I'm going like uh hey man <laughs> um <laughs> do, do do I know you and he goes yeah I'm Will Lily's assistant and I was like oh Jesus God like I I could I, I wouldn't have known you know what I mean <laughs> I was like so embarrassed but you know I'm sure we've all had this experience with this stuff now but but anyway um so those were some, those were a couple, I mean, there's been a bunch, but that from live experiences, right? Yeah. Um, now, a studio experience, well, actually one wasn't a studio, it was more a rehearsal thing when I got to re- rehearse with Frank Zappa. We didn't get to the point of recording, but I did, well, two things happened with Frank. I got to play, uh, audition for him, sorry, when Vinny was then kicked out of the band or quit. I'm not exactly sure how that story went, but it was one of, I think it was a little of both. Um, but anyway, so they were having auditions and I got an invitation because it was a closed audition. And at that time, my instru- my mentor from and teacher from uh, CalArts, John Bergamo, had worked with Frank. So he recommended me as well as Frank's orchestral conductor, who was my percussion instructor and still is my a mentor of my, I mean, I say mentor. I mean, he's been a, was a mentor of mine then. Uh, now we're friends and he's got this really cool organization called called um, Ar- uh, Artists 
for the number four piece. And I'll uh, talk a little bit more about that. But anyway, he's in New York and uh, Joel's, his name's Joel Thome. And he's got to be, I don't even know how late eighties now or something, but whatever. And he's still cranking, man. His brain just is amazing. Um, <clears throat> I mean, he had a big stroke a, a bunch of years ago, but he's still pushing, man. It's a, it's just amazing. So very inspirational from him. Anyway, so he was Frank's conductor for all the crazy orchestras, you know, orchestra and 20th century, you know, Frank's insanity. And so he had recommended me. So that's how I got to the audition. So that was a really great thing. So that was the first thing that happened. I didn't get the gig, obviously, but Chad Wackerman got the gig. But um, but then I got to work with Frank later in a smaller ensemble setting. My A friend of mine uh, from this weird percussion trio that we had when we were in graduate school and we were in graduate school together. So it was Bob Fernandez, the percussionist who, Kalani, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Art Jarvin and, and myself. And then Frank's assignment, writing, because Art was copying for Frank at the time. And uh, and he said, hey, I I can't get these orchestra pieces rehearsed. You know, Frank was really picky and whatnot. And he said, I can't get these pieces played and rehearsed and whatever, performed the way I want them. So I'm just going to do, can you just, I need you to do a two piano transcription of these particular orchestra pieces. So Art gets the idea, hey, if I do a transcription for two pianos and take the percussion, six percussion parts, reduce those to three players, would you guys want to learn the parts and then we'll all rehearse this together, then we'll present it to Frank. So we did. Frank loved it. <clears throat> Long story short, Frank loved it. He says, okay, we're going to do eight rehearsals, one every other week for eight for eight rehearsals and then we're going to record we get to the seventh rehearsal we were done now we have two weeks off good till the next rehearsal frank gets a call from the buffalo phil that they've accepted to do his pieces and record them so we were one rehearsal away from getting to record with frank which bummed us all out but mm -hmm. anyway but working with him in that setting was really awesome that was one uh, so that was pretty cool and then, uh, and, but then from a, a live thing, um, or I don't know, a studio thing, um, oh boy, oh my God, I got to work with Clint Eastwood on, um, oh. on American Sniper, that was really cool, and that basically was an interesting gig because there was no music, so basically me and three drummers, I had all my percussion gear there, and we just did overdubs, basically created these five cues for the movie, of course, we're not the composer on it, but anyway, that opens up. <laughs> yeah. uh, but anyway, uh, it was great to work with Clint on that. That was really cool. Uh, so that was yeah. American Sniper. And then I, I just, and then just as an aside, I had this one other experience, uh, more than once, but one other experience. I got, um, oh my God, there's so many. Uh, but one time, this is going back a bunch of years. I remember I was doing this orchestra. It was an orchestra piece. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, for a movie. We were working for a, a composer by the name of Chris Beck. So I'm back in the percussion section and we were all in the same room together. No overdubbing or anything at that time. And um, this could have been 10 years ago, maybe 12. I don't even know now. I don't remember. But um, I remember uh, there was a cue that I wasn't playing on. So I was like, I'm just going to kind of stand here and listen. So like we're in the percussion, but I kind of stepped up a little bit right behind the brass. And in front of them was woodwinds. And in front of them was all the strings and basses and like whatnot, looking at the conductor this way. and. It was just so amazing to be in that room and just kind of close my eyes and just listen to that, just what was going on musically. And I just was like, oh my God, if I died like right now, I'm gonna try to be morose, but like, <laughs> this is it, man. I mean, it doesn't get any better than this. This was, it was really an amazing moment for me. You know, I mean, not that I hadn't experienced that before, but I really had a chance to just kind of take it in because I didn't have to think about anything. I wasn't playing, you know, so I could just listen. And, uh, you know, there's been a lot of those, you know, so anyway, yeah. so that's a few things, but, um, you know, but, uh, you know, every studio experience is, every gig is different, as you well know, uh, yeah. even live gigs. I mean, so uh, like yeah. I'm, I'm playing later today. We're doing a benefit, but uh, with my band Opium Moon. But um, Thursday night, I had this gig with this artist in town. His name is George Kahn. I don't know if you know him, Kalani, or not. But anyway, he's got a group called the Jazz George Kahn Jazz Blues Review, which is an offshoot of his trio and quartet stuff. But anyway, so it's these three girl singers in a four piece band. And we did a, a, a benefit for Path Ventures, which is a housing thing, a uh, homeless thing we've done for 16 mm -hmm. years now. And, uh, and 
that is just an amazing thing too. You know what I mean? It's just a complete, so every situation's different. When I love them, love them all. I mean, if somebody said to me, cause I play a lot of drum set and I play a lot of percussion as well. So if somebody said to me at this point, dude, you got to decide what's it going to be. You're going to play drum set or you're going to play, what are you going to do? And I'm like, then I'm not deciding. I can't decide that. <laughs> <laughs> that's it's not something I could I because I, I love such a variety of music and at this point in my life I mean with this band particularly uh, Opium Moon if I had if I only played drum set I wouldn't be in this band that happened to have won a Grammy you know two years ago so you know so that's kind of cool but <laughs> so but I love all these different styles of music and I love in collecting instruments. I mean, I still, man, I just bought a new set of Tycos this year, which is really crazy, but anyway, <laughs> so, you know, well, um, me, yeah, that it is awesome. I, I totally relate to what you're saying too. It's hard to choose, you know, we, it, cause every instrument connects you with a culture it, and a people and yeah. grooves and rhythms and all kinds of stuff. But yeah. let me open it up to, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, and you can sure. type them or you can raise your hand and unmute yourself and, and ask MB anything. Yeah, you can, you can ask me anything you want. If I have an answer, I'll tell you. <laughs> and just keep in mind, you know, your studio stuff, live stuff, recording, instruments, uh, <laughs> Every, you know, basically MB, you're, you know, you're a very well-rounded percussionist in that you have the orchestral side, you've got jazz, you've got the drum set, all the styles of drum set, world yeah. percussion, yeah. you know, so if you guys have any, or, or if you want any advice, now's your chance. Well, uh, let me, let me ask you guys questions. So Roseanne, uh, let's start with Roseanne. Where are you? Where, where, first of all. And then Mark, Mark has a question also in the, in oh. the chat. Okay. Okay. But. But go ahead, uh, go ahead with your, go ahead, MB and Roseanne, and then, and then look at Mark's question in the chat, or I can read it to you. Okay. Um, I'm in Canada, Ottawa. Oh, oh okay, cool. All right. Uh, I'm like a total beginner uh, in percussion. I've uh, been doing it, well, it started at the start of lockdown, so it was something to do. <laughs> But it's a great thing to do. I'm sure you found out at this yeah, point. I, 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 I told my boss I'm now semi-retired and starting a new career. Um, and uh, one thing I'm, uh, and Kalani probably has a lot of good advice on this too, but getting started with recording, like what's a good starting setup for if you want to do some maybe looping or just recording. Right, right. <clears throat> Um, well, okay. I, there's a few ways to go with this. You're going to have to figure out what DAW you want to use, what recording system you want to use, we'll say, um, setup, which is like, so there's Pro Tools, there's Digital Performer, there's Logic, there's Cubase. And those would be the main four. There's others, but I would say, I mean, some people just use GarageBand. I don't use GarageBand personally. I use, I have for what all the work that I do, I, I need to have something like higher end. So I have a Pro Tools system. So, but now some of this stuff is not cheap. So I would say as a system to start learning on would be, uh, yeah, digital audio workstation is what DAW means. Um, you're going to need this and you're going to need a computer that can handle this. So uh, I would say get a, get a, I would say start with digital. I don't know, Kalani, you might have some input here as well, but Performer or, or, or Logic, they're cheaper and prefer, particularly Logic comes with like a set of instruments itself that you can, you know, play from a keyboard and sample or trigger or whatever. And which doesn't happen with D DP, uh, Digital Performer, it doesn't happen with Pro Tools. If, uh, if or, you're, or, yeah, if you're on a Mac, uh, I'm, I'm on a Mac system and I use, yes. I use Logic. Because it's comes with it basically, or it's inexpensive and it's loaded with stuff. No, but let me uh, let me interject something real quick because what MB is talking about is is good stuff. That's all computer based stuff. That's all like multi tracking. But That's I wanted right. to go back and ask you. You want to record, but what do you you know what do you want to? What's the finished product look like? Is it just a recording of you playing something? Because if you're just playing one thing and you want to record it, you could use something like a Zoom recorder. Or there's some right. really good quality standalone recorders or maybe a looper like you said you could maybe use a looper like the rc uh the rc 505 the boss rc 
505, the one that I use, which is pretty good. And and then you're going to spend four or five hundred dollars and you get a lot of features that you can use. So it just kind of depends on, again, going back to like and, what is the finished product that you're going for? Yeah, there's that. And then then and those things like the Zoom recorder has a it's a really great instrument and has a stereo built in microphone. And you would just use that. There you go. That's it. <laughs> there you go. Look at that thing. I mean, that's, you know, and that's and it's digital audio. Then you can play yeah. it back over. Now, so then back to Kalani's question, Roseanne, for you would be, so how deep do you want to get with this? Because the deeper you get, then you're going to need a mic pre, micro, at least a probably a stereo pair of something. Um, and you could start with Octavas or, you know, there's cheaper microphones. You don't have to spend a fortune on mics. Um but then and then get that into a recorded system. So then you can go like, oh, I recorded this. And then, oh, I could record that. And in Logic or all these DAWs, you have you can just do tracks and tracks and tracks and tracks of recording because you said looping. So I wasn't sure if you meant create a loop like in this boss looper so that then you can play to record that and then play to it. Right. There's that. But it that would be like a live type thing, a live kind of setting. I guess you could fly that into your computer, but say once again, if you're going to do any of this and fly it into your computer, you have have to have a system that you can record to. So you know, but there's cheap ways. Logic is not that expensive, and so that's a good way to go. Then there's the learning curve of all this stuff, which getting into digital recording and all that. But if you're computer savvy and you don't mind sitting there, and you were saying like you're you know, moving into retirement or changing careers or whatever, and you have the time, hey, it's a great outlet, man. You know, it's a creative outlet. Um, and, and you know, like I said, and there's tons of people who know so much about this stuff that you, you and there's forums and you can find out about all this. If you ever have a question about micro, if you want to get that, go that deep, talk about microphones or whatever, you can always contact me or Kalani, I'm sure. And um, and I can tell you a whole list, slew of stuff that, you know, you don't need to spend a fortune on microphones, you know, but, you know. But you good- do want to, you do want to have a budget because, um, yeah. and I would say like what MB is talking about, I, I think, you know, you your, your sound is going to start with the mic. Yes. You know, it's kind of like when you buy uh i just upgraded my my listening stereo system a few years ago and everybody's like spend 70 percent of your money on your speakers because that's what the sound is coming out of you have to have good speakers of course you want good everything but i would say spend the most on your mic because if it's not getting into the microphone if it doesn't you know if you don't have a good mic it doesn't matter what you're putting that signal on too right it doesn't matter how you're storing it or what you're doing after that so, I mean, you, it's never ending. It's a, it's a, it's kind of a rabbit hole situation, you know, and it's weakest, it's a weakest link syndrome too, because if you have a good mic, then you have to get a good preamp, then you have to get a good recorder, then you have, you know, it just kind of it can snowball, but you know, have a budget and then you work with your budget. Yeah. You don't need to spend, let's just talk about Mike real quick. Again, um, you don't need to spend $3,000 like on a Neumann or something like that. You, and there's, you could spend a lot, you can lend, spend less than $800 and get a really good mic. Okay. So there's that. Um, just to interject, I just bought these. Are they the, off of, uh, these oh, are your classic, you your classic the, pair of Neumann. You know. Are they the one eighty or the one eighty fours or the? Or I one, think they are. Yeah, I don't even remember. Yeah, I think I really can't read it without my glasses. Those are these great. Are awesome. you, can, you can get one of these though on like Reverb. I bought this on Reverb.com. It's almost like new, and I think I paid eleven hundred uh, for a stereo pair of these. So you can yeah, buy one cool. of these mics. I'll, I'll tell you. I can tell you later. I'll look it up. You know, maybe four or five hundred bucks, and then you're set. You really for a while. I mean, these will record a lot of things really well. So for, per, for anything you're doing percussion wise, those are those are great mics. And there's a there's a lot of there's a bunch. So, yeah. Yeah. Again. And that, that was the next thing I was going to mention with which Kalani just said was Reverb.com is a great source. But there's other sources for used gear. Now, there's always the issue. The Reverb you can count on. OK, Reverb is going to have high quality stuff. Quality. Yeah. They wouldn't say in business otherwise. So be careful about the source that you're using to buy used gear. But you can buy really good used stuff and 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 
you know, then you're, then it's even better, you know? So anyway, um, so does that answer your question, Roseanne? Yeah, it does. It gives me a lot of good information, good ideas, and a kind of a starting point of how to dive into this. So yes, thank yeah. you. Thank yeah, you yeah. Much. And it can, like I will say, it can be a little bit overwhelming, but so just take it a step at a time. And so you go like, okay, I need this. So I'm going to, okay, now, now what? Now I have to learn about this and then a good mic. And again, if you go to this route that we're talking about with a mic, then you need a preamp, but you can get stereo, just a little stereo. You don't need an eight channel. You don't need eight. Like I got in my studio, I got 16 channels of, of, uh, of preamps. I mean, that's because I'm doing a different thing, but, um, and that's built up over the years, you know, for the longest time I only had eight. And, and then when I redid it, I have another eight. So, um, <clears throat> but a stereo pair, a mic pre is great. Even a mono mic pre, but you know, and so you can, you can get, and then you that, plug your mic into that, that goes into your, you know, whatever, da, 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 and then you yeah. can just start recording. So anyway, um, uh, Mark had a question. Um, what is that? Hey, Mark, how you doing, man? Where, so Mark, where are you? Where, where, where are you in the, in the world? You got to unmute. Yeah, go down to the. There you go. Hi, um, I'm basically uh, on Nantucket Island, and right now oh. I'm in Cambridge, right down the street from MIT Media Lab. Oh, okay, cool. A bunch of experimental musicians are, are working on uh, a bunch of things, and then I spent some time in uh, in Chiang Mai, Thailand. So, wow, those are my three. So Nantucket, kind of that's beautiful, <laughs> beautiful country. Also, over there. Yeah. I want to mention Mark has an app that <laughs> maybe MB you can help. You can, you should you guys should connect and then and then get MB's yeah. input on that too. Yeah, that's pretty experimental. Mark has a jam, uh, jamming, uh, music jamming app. Oh wow! Okay, let me write that down. Uh, yeah, Mark, I'll, I'll give everybody my my contact stuff you know, before we get out of here today. Uh, sure. So music jamming app, meaning like, so how can you talk a little bit about that real quick? Yeah, it's um it's something that I've been working on for actually the last. Uh, year and a half and um, uh, it's it's a way of letting anybody play music basically so I'm interested in making music more social uh, mm -hmm. and yeah. also spatial and this is kind of a most people think of music as something that's produced by musicians and performed by musicians and listened to by an audience the reason I'm a big fan of Kalani is he sort of bridges this gap between the real musicians of the world and the drum circles, you know, he's got this background in, in yeah. music therapy. Yeah. And uh, for the past 10 years on Nantucket, I've been leading um, our community drum circle. Oh, cool. Awesome. Yeah. So I'm really interested in this aspect of what happens when people get together who don't necessarily know how to play anything. Uh, you know, music for world peace and all this, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And, and the app is sort of a, a way of exploring how to get people to be able to play music together using just their smartphones. All right, I'd love to I'd love to pursue that with you man and, and find out more about it and talk to you about sure. it. That's yeah. We can uh, do that. Yeah, it's I can just type in the URL of the website. Okay. But I was interested in your experience about uh, you mentioned that you had studied gamelan. Yeah. And to me this is wow, this is just so outside my experience of music in the western world, you know, the rhythms they have. The it's like yeah. Paul Barak and I study a little bit when I was in Bali, but I was curious, just any comments you have about Indonesian music, what, what your experience was? Uh, well, I mean, again, you know, um, when you do it like as a, you know, I wasn't an Indonesian, I wasn't a gamelan major. I was a percussion major. So, um, and, and not even a world music. I was, a per that was my major percussion. So that meant a lot of things when I was at Cal Arts. But um, so uh, but my experience with that was because, you know, Javanese and Balinese are uh, different. And um, and the interesting thing, particularly with the Balinese stuff, is it gets so with all the all the um, the interwoven patterns. Right. That's really what I loved about that. And um, and and understanding I, you know like we're so in our music and western music particularly 
not just classical, but pop, the music that we know, pop, we'll just call it popular music. You can call it jazz, funk, fusion, pop, right? Whatever. We're downbeat oriented, right? <clears throat> not in Indonesian music. Right. The downbeat comes at the end of the end of a phrase and they don't even use bars. Right. right. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a like, oh, here's in four, four. Nah, it's just a long, same with Indian music. So long phrase. Yeah. Yeah. And then this big, doo, you know, whatever we're, and you're playing these big tuned nipple gongs, right? That comes at the end of the phrase, not the downbeat of the phrase. And it was always mess us up, man. Cause it's like, we want to hear the downbeat. And so we had, you know, you'd have to change your thinking. Right. And then, then, so then there's that one element. And then the, the other beautiful element of that was again, this interlocking woven thing, which when you look at a composer, like particularly Steve Reich, but um, John Adams, Steve Reich, Philip Glass, there's others, um, but those being the popular, you know, people and most famous in this, in this, that world, um, they took, particularly Steve Reich took those elements. You, you've heard the piece drumming by Steve Reich. I'd okay. Check that out. Check that out. You guys should all check this out. It's an insanely awesome piece of music. And I got to tell you, I've performed it a couple times. And uh, it, it's not easy. It's when you listen to it, you're like, ah, oh, it's just like that. And then it kind of phases to this. And it's a, it's not that simple because the because again, you're doing these phasing patterns. So you got to just see how you know how your pattern works into this other pattern displaced by a beat or displaced by another beat or whatever, because they morph that way. That's how they morph. Check out drumming. It's a long, it's a super long piece that was done in, by the way, uh, 1971, I believe, or two. I mean, it was around there sometime um, when that was actually the, 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 the massive, the big recording of that piece. You can go online and hear tons of people playing it now, college ensembles and all this kind of stuff. But um, it's a beautiful piece of music, man. And, and he, they take, he takes all these elements of this interwoven gamelan stuff as well as African, this whole thing, because Africa, because if you think about it, there's a lot of music in from uh, di different countries of Africa that is also it's all pattern oriented, but it's it's woven right. It's counterpoint, so it's just like oh, zoom zack zack. You, you think no? Oh, here's the other thing. So if you're talking about African, say African music, pick a country again, but. Um, there's a lot of that tripleted 12 8 feel, if you if you will. It's not zoom ticket, you can take it. It's not you could have that straight uh, duple meter feel, but a lot of music from different countries in Africa are tripleted based, right? So we'll just call it 12 8. Zeka the decket the decket. Now the cool thing about that is doom gang 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 gang. Now if you ever studied like when I studied uh, a way drumming. Um, you, you get these counterpoint because like a lot of the dance is dancing the, a different pulse across the bar. Right. So you're dancing and the dance is based around the music. Right. Again, same thing with Gamelon. All these cult. That's what I love about these cultures is the dance is all integrated in the music. And it's not so much that way. Uh, in our in Western music, I mean, it is in a certain degree. You can go back to classical. I mean, people were dancing to Mozart. You know what I mean? And uh, you know, the gavotte and the, the whatever. You know, the you know waltz and the, all this and that and the other thing. Um, so there were dances that go with that. But I wouldn't say people were dancing to Chopin. <laughs> you know, like it's a different thing. You know, so like and 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 a lot and but all of pick Western music, right? Jazz. There was like a dance that went along with early jazz. You know, now when you talk about bebop, people aren't really dancing to bebop. But I mean, you, you can feel it. You can move to it. Right. But certainly funk, rock and roll, R&B, blues. You know, there's a movement in there that goes. Now, there, are there designated dances? No. I mean, there were historically designated dances to a lot of different musics, Western culture. But but in world music, in a lot of world musics, the Dance is super integrated to a piece of music. It's all part of the same thing, you know. So that's now, unfortunately, I, I well, not unfortunately, I've been to Indonesia, I've been to Jakarta, and I've also been to Bali. Um, 
unfortunately, I did not get to study Indonesian music there. I wish I had. That would have been, I wasn't there long enough to do any of that, but that would have been great. But um, so anyway, so my experience with that, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but um, uh, but so I, I find two, the two interesting things about that is where the downbeat happens to be in these mus- in this music. And um, because it's just a different long phrase. And then and then all these integrated patterns. Oh, and then the two scales that are used in Indonesian music, which is Pelog and Slendro. So I find that. And oh, here's the other fascinating thing. I did find this out when I was in, 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 in the, um, particularly in Bali. So we went to a couple of different villages. Well, guess what? So that's insane, man. Uh, did you go to visit any gong makers or? Were yeah, make- no, I, I went out into the jungle and I uh, purchased a, a 22 kilo gong and I shipped it back to my house. It took you, that's when it, I hope that's yeah, when no, it was affordable. It. <laughs> it was it was it cost a lot even or sourcing it right from the jungle. There. Yeah. yeah, right. I saw how they're made and these gong factories just fascinating. You know? I know. Well, so we went to a couple of these places where. You see that you walk into this hut it's it's, i mean i don't even know how hot it is it's insane it's already hot in there anyway and you walk into this hut and they fire this thing and these guys are wearing no protection barefooted and they've got their feet around this thing and you know that's holding this pot this boiling pot of metal or uh in the in the case of when they actually get pour it out into this mold to make the bars and they're hammering they're not wearing ear protection they're handling <laughs> pounding this stuff bang 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 <laughs> to shake the bars now there's a guy usually a guy i mean i guess there could be women but i think it's men, mostly men um who are doing this work and there's one designated person who is the person who is responsible for the tuning of that those bars and that you could go from that village and go to another village just literally five miles away or 10 miles away or whatever and the tuning is different they're not the same to pitch Hmm. close but they're it's not the same so it's however that guy person hears the tuning and that's that scale and that's the tuning of that scale. I mean, like I said, there's a relationship of what the what those pitches should be, but it's not the same pitch when you go to another village. I never knew that before, and I was like, "Wow, that could be wild!" Pulling a bunch of <laughs> a bunch of ensembles together, that could be really crazy, you know, like all like quarter tones apart, you know, like something that could be pretty wild. <laughs> so I never I never realized that, but that's that's the way that we're now. Maybe now. All these years later, it's more uniform. I'm not sure, but I don't think so. I think it's, I think it's, that's another element of that music. So anyway. I got the impression that there's no such thing as a resolution melodically. There's no, mm-hmm. there's no concept of like a condensa. Oh, yes. Keep going. <laughs> it, it, it could conceivably keep going. Right. Yeah. And like yeah. I said, there are these super long phrases, you know, and Indian music is very similar. Now in Indian music, you're dealing with tall, right. Which you count on your, on the joints of your fingers. At least that's the way we learned it. So, you know, so if, 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 if there's a tall, say 16 beats, right. Is, is, would be teen top. So not, uh, uh, da, din, din, da, da, din, din, da, then, not which is the open, not ten ten na, da din din da, right? So 16 beats. So you're not thinking now we could translate that into uh, a, a bar. So four beats, four beats, four beats, four beats, which when I studied with Tarnath and this other gentleman by the name of Amya, that's who I studied Sargam with, um, Amya Dasgupta. Um, that we came up with this, I say we, it was really some other people in the class, but that I, friends when I was in school together, um, who came up with our own little notation system. So when we'd write our notes, we write it in four, four, you know, it, we just so, cause again, it was this mental thing of like, and oh, and by the way about Indian music. Okay. And I've, I've transgressed, I digressed over to India now, but um, if, if you were now let's talk, in the terms now you were to go like i really want to go to india and study tabla okay and you're just going to go and you're going to be entrenched um you would go and you would be with your master tabla teacher 
And you would probably for the first year never touch the instrument. You would sit there and learn counting and the syllables, which is the sokatu. Uh, you would then learn these compositions vocally. And then like a year later, you probably start, you'll start putting the sounds to, to on the drums to the sound of the, because there's a sound for every, everything that you sing. So, you know, like the, the sounds on the tabla, uh, I wish I had one here to show you, but na tin tun tut ti de, de ne gay, which is the low bion gay key cut, which is a slap down. And then you take these combinations of those sounds, which now you get da din like that, right? And so, and daddy, 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 there's all these other syllables that come, sounds that come into play. So, um, and again, so that, now that's, and that is downbeats, you know, but, and then there's an open, and so you, and you count it this way, clap, hands like, you'll see you know, like an Indian concert, somebody's clapping tall, you know, and then open, two, three, four, close, two, and then a big downbeat. Beginning of the phrase, 16 beats later. They don't think in terms of bar. They think in terms of beats. So you could have a 12-beat phrase. You could have a three-beat phrase. You could have a 107-beat phrase. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? <laughs> so, so Indonesian music doesn't even do that. They, you just, you just learn this form. They're not really counting in that way. You, know, you just learn this form. And it'd be funny when we... Because I studied with a gentleman by the name of uh, two, well, two. The Balinese uh, gentleman was Wenton. Um, his name was Wenton, and his dad or his father-in-law was a gentleman by the name of Pachokro Wastididopro. <laughs> Pachokro was like the Beethoven of Indonesia of uh, of uh, of uh, Java. He, I mean, the guy had written like six hundred compositions. And so, and when you'd learn these, you, you'd go like, you think like, okay, well, how many, how much can you do with these scales? Well, with, with, cause you're talking about either six notes or five notes, huh? It was amazing. They, I mean, you, once you delved into it you, and really dove into it, you, you go like, oh man, wow. That's really different than that other piece we just learned. And you're thinking like, if there's only how many how many notes are we talking about depending on what scale it's crazy but um and and he would he would and he was those people were very mellow unlike the africans the africans would get very upset with you at cal arts if you didn't play something <laughs> right <laughs> they were like that was a whole different deal but uh yeah and go to africa and study i had a buddy that went to africa and study west africa studied you know djembe dun dun drumming and uh you talk about doing your you know if you're if you have teachers over there, he, he has scars. <laughs> I'm not even joking because he, he got he probably got hit with the stick a couple of times. I'm sure. Yeah, a bunch yeah. of times. Yeah, they it, they have this sort of corporal uh, <laughs> methodology that goes along with. Well, but you that's know a, that's that's at the real high high level. Like you're playing, you know, see, that's the real serious stuff. But yeah, so I don't know, Mark. Did I? I, I hope I answered your yeah, question. Yeah, no, that's about... fascinating. Really yeah. good insights. Thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah, it's really wonderful. Yeah. We're, so, we're, uh, yeah, that's amazing. I mean, this is why we do these hangs because, because there's so much to talk about in this world of, you know, percussion and music. Um, we do need to kind of get, uh, think about wrapping up. Uh, in terms of the community, th I just want to say one thing about your thing, Mark, that you're, you're right in that, you know, we, I think we want to make music welcoming and accessible to people. But yeah. at the same time, one of the one of the things that I always struggle with is this idea of like the messaging out there that you see a lot of uh, people and companies promoting like oh drumming's easy everyone can do it, which is which is a little bit problematic when you really want to promote quality um, quality drumming and and quality music for people and you want to make it welcoming but you don't want to um, downgrade it we don't want to we don't want to uh, downgrade the art form while we're trying to make it accessible and that's always the tricky path to walk so i like to say you know anybody can start uh every it, the wor world of percussion is open to anyone to start the journey and at the same time talking to mb and talking to other percussionists we know that that journey is is never ending and it's vast and it's deep and a lot of the things like mb i'm glad you mentioned that about the gamelon music because what what we've heard here i think today is that a lot of the music has things that are very subtle 
but that those are important and they become big things. The little things become big things. Yeah. The more we study, you right. know, and, and the more we listen, the more we know, the more we don't know. Right. The more. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so well, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it's, you know, it's, it's this, it's the journey. I mean, you know, like if you're, if you're a, a goal oriented person, which I think, I think just societally, you know, if that's a word, uh, we're kind of forced to be that way. Um, and I, I, so, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but you can be goal oriented. That's fine. But we have to, I think in general, as artists, as in this case, percussionists and drummers, um, and musicians, um, you got to enjoy this process because, you know, there's, there's so much along the way and there's so many, many diversions, you know, like um, I still happen, like I said, I, you know, I, I would be hard pressed to decide between drum set or the world of the vast world of percussion is what am I going to do as a career? Well, it's, I'm getting old, man. <laughs> you know, like I'm on the back end of all this stuff, you know, not, not to be morose, but like, I still feel like I got a long ways to go. I got a lot to learn. And I also feel like ironic. I don't know if it's ironic or not, but I feel like on many levels, I'm playing better now than I did when I'm 30 years ago because of the knowledge that I've accumulated that I can bring to my playing, even sort of just, because th through osmosis, not because I'm thinking about it. I will tell you this, though, from studying those musics that I studied at Cal Arts, my drum set playing changed totally. And not to the point of like, you know, because you got to lay down a groove, dunk, gak, gunk, gunk, gak, gunk. You know, like, how did Indian music affect that? You know what I mean? Only as a concept in terms of time and structure. Right. So, so yeah, then, then it's like, okay, when you're playing, dude, you're going to play that, you know what I mean? You know, I'm not thinking like, I'm not thinking about all this other stuff going on in there, but it, but it was all those studies that had just all of a sudden just amassed into like one big thing, I guess in my brain that, um, and it's like, I started hearing music a little bit differently, you know, in general. Um, so, uh, and even still it's changing, you know, where you go like, and I, well, this has happened more than once, but, um, I've had this conversation, even in my band, I say my band, our band, the band that I'm in, um, the opium moon group. And it's like, and I've, I've said this comment to, to them and I've said it to other people in other situations. Look, I, I love sol uh, soloing. I love doing, bye. <laughs> I, you know, I love doing a lot of different things. Um, but I, I really could care less if I ever play another solo in my life. And it's not because I don't think I have something to say. It's just that, you know, you can go on YouTube and Instagram and particularly that and see, oh my God, these people who you just go like I could I would if I stop doing everything and only practice 10 hours a day I might sound like that in a year two years or five years or 10 years if I'm lucky you know what I mean and it's like what I'm not quite sure what the point of that would be you know what I mean at this point um, Look what I can do yeah I mean it's <laughs> it's it's like now if you can do that and you're going to do something bigger creatively musically and make that work oh wow that's now you're that's another level but if it's just like look at my chops i'm not there now man i mean i i, I can appreciate it and and again i'm not it's just you know maybe part of it is like a jealousy thing oh my god i wish i could play like that but i can't and i don't so, you know, I, I don't know what to say at that point. It was like, so what, do we all stop playing music because we can't do a particular thing? No, there's got to be, there's something that everybody has to say. If that was the case, there would not be new stuff coming out all the time. If I could interject for a second and maybe use this as a, as a place to wrap up where we started, which is what you said, MB, about, you know, what, why, why do you like playing music in the first place? And you said it's about playing together with people, you know, and it is, I agree with you hundred percent. 
It's about that connection. There's something, you know, there is something that's irreplaceable and special about playing music with other people, right? We know yeah. that. We you can you can compose all you want, you can record all you want, you can practice all you want, but that's not what that's not going to get you there. That's not going to create that magic moment of connection. And um I know I one of the things I love is that chemistry, right? That 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 happens when you're playing with other people. And I think it has to do with listening, it has to do with empathy, it has to do with hearing others and being heard and acknowledging other people and creating in the moment and having those little, okay, I guess this is where we're going now. And, oh, this happens and that happens. And there's a lot of musical games that get played, right? When you're interacting with other people. And I think, not to speak for anyone else but myself, but that's the kind of stuff that I love, right? Those little magic moments uh, and the musical playfulness, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's not about the. It's not about each. It shouldn't be, to, as far as I'm concerned, anyway. About your ego, you know. I mean, right. many times we've done these interviews, like with Opium Moon, and, and other times in, interviews that I've just done or whatever. And it's we get into the concept of what's happening musically or whatever. And it's like at the, in, in, at the end of the day, and I don't want to get all sound all metaphysical or anything, but whatever. But but really. I really still believe, and I've believed this forever, or for at least a super long time of my life, um, that when we're playing, it's like, this stuff is out here, man. And then when you play, even if it's written, but certainly when you're improvising, uh, you are now channeling that and bringing that into an audible situation, right? You're making that real now right mm -hmm. here it's floating around the africans used to do that all the time the gentleman i studied with you know because here's a perfect example so we we'd be playing and we get lost right like we were like what because he's playing this out and we're like where's what you know like where was the cue like that was a cue right for us to change patterns or whatever and we like missed it and of course he throw a stick at you or something or whatever and then, and then or if you happen to be sitting next to me whack you on the arm or the leg with this thing it was sitting covered well either but anyway you had to be careful in this day and age in this country now with all that stuff but um yeah. but anyway uh so so somebody one day see goes like where's one and all of a sudden it's dead silence and uh, Kobla, the, the teacher, the, one of the, he's actually royalty from this tribe, and the Awe tribe. Uh, he goes like this, he silence, and then he goes, boom, like that. <laughs> like in their world, one, it, that, that, that groove was going, you know, like it was just circling all the time, <laughs> man. And he, where's one? Oh, here it is. Bam, you know, like he was waiting for it, you know. Okay. And we just we just sat there and was like, fuck. I was like, what? <laughs> I mean, that still, when I think about that today, I just like that still blows my mind. Because that's how big that is musically. You know what I mean? It's a it's a big thing that all of a sudden just went whoop, boom. There you go. And that just changed my life, you know, like, I mean, I mean there were so many moments like that, you know, uh, so, and I, hey, so not to change something real quick, David, so where, where are you, David, and what, what's your, what do you, what do you, uh, what's your sort of jam? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I'm in Austin, Texas. Oh, okay, cool. And I played off and on, uh, mostly as an amateur, a little bit of professional younger in life, but came to percussion late in life and uh, joined a community band just because I, like you, I collected so many instruments over my lifetime. I just yeah. decided I had to play them somewhere. And uh, of course, you know, COVID slowed a lot of that down. But um, the questions I had, you covered so much information and I have already heard Steve Reich's drumming many times. Oh, good. I yeah. Enjoyed that. But um, I, the question I had was about automated rhythms and drum machines and how much that's impacted your, your finances, really, I guess. Oh, uh, wow. Funny. Do, do we have time, Kalani, to for me to talk about that a little bit? You know, I'm OK if you guys are OK. We I mean, I don't have to we don't have to stop okay. right now. I just didn't want to keep anyone. Uh, no. OK. Up, if you guys are OK, we, let's keep going. Yeah, I'll address sure. that. And we can talk a little bit about that. And then uh, and it's funny you should ask about that on a couple levels. All right. So back up to. Oh, my God. 
uh, 20 some years ago, you know, when, you know, the Lynn drum machine and how long ago was that? Was that 30 years ago? I hate to break it to you, but it was more like 35. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, Early ouch, age, yeah. ouch, ouch, ouch. <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> I, know, okay. I, remember, I remember. So yeah. Yeah. Right. So, okay. So go back to that. Cause that was the first big one that came out. There was other ones coming up, but that was the really one that kind of, whoa, flip people out, change stuff. And then everybody was making a big stink about it. And I remember being on a session with a friend of mine. Um, and uh, he said, uh, we got into this thing about drum machines. And he said, hey, man, like, you know, because a lot of people were fighting that thing, you know, like, like, drum, how, how, that's, how sacrilege, man. It's like, it's like almost heresy, you know, as far as the percussion world, you know, or drumming world. Um, and so, uh, he said, well, I don't know. What, how do you think about this, man? What do you feel about this? Like, and I said, David, I said, look, dude, it's not going away. Okay. It's that stuff is here to stay, man. Well, here to stay now means that's even old and gone. What's here to stay now is all this stuff inside your computer. Forget drum machines. I mean, although they exist. And, and so within that, check this out. So three weeks ago now, month ago, whatever, I got hired to play, bring all my crazy two truckload. I didn't bring it, but my cartridge company did. Two truckloads of gear, it turned out. I didn't even know what it was going to be at the time. So my Tycos and a really funky kind of crazy kit and a bunch of metal junk percussion and bass toms and bass doom dooms and toms. And I mean, we had a room full of stuff at East West here in LA. Well, the gig was this. It's for a video game. That's going to come out in like a year or so. And so uh, so what happened was they hired me to, to kind of oversee this and be principal, if you will, percussion on this thing. And then this other player, this guy named Brain, who it turns out played with Primus. I don't know if you know that band, but Brain's like he's, he's a badass drummer, man. But he kind of doesn't do this anymore. He's kind of songwriting with with with. Um, uh, uh, Axl Rose, and he's just doing a whole different thing. I don't really kind of know his whole career path at the moment, but anyway, but so he's there playing, and they hire this guy, this guy named Basic, to show up with all of his. He's a DJ beat maker. Now, this is kind of the epitome of what you're asking me, David, because something like what. So this guy shows up and he's got like tables full of like Moogs, you know, plug in Moogs and drum pads. And I mean, I mean, not pads, but, you know, finger pads, like like little drum machine, like so much. So I don't even know that world now. And so the concept was that the composer who here we go again, actually hadn't composed anything <laughs> except in her head. Right. And she because she knew this guy's work and she knew what I did and she knew what brain did. And so so in her mind, she once wanted us to create these basically rhythm patterns, the beats, whatever, for her to then go into a computer program like what we were talking about before and cut them up, morph it, twist it, whatever. And she's going to then recreate the rhythm part anyway of her score. She's a cellist. So she's going to add that. She's going to add all kinds of other elements, but she wanted to start with this as a bed. So we just start a groove and she goes like, I know I'm, and she kind of guide us. She'd go like, I, I kind of hear something like something like this, or she play us an example of something or that she heard or something. And this is what we did for three days. And at first I, I, I'm going to be very honest that the first half of the first day, I was kind of pissed because I'm going like, what you can't compose some music man you're paying us i mean we were getting paid very well for this and i'm going like i'm writing your effing music man no that's bullshit you know like i'm sorry pardon my english but uh it changed as we got into it and started seeing how this thing was morphing and by the third day oh man it was ridiculous the stuff we were coming up with I mean, it, and it was super fun. There was no egos, no egos. I was the one, I guess, if anything, may, a bit, had a bit of an ego to start with because I'm thinking like, hey, I'm not the composer here, man. Tell me what you want to play. I'll play it. You know what I mean? I mean, you don't have to have it written, but hey, what instrument? And then, so then she started getting pickier though. And at one point she said, you know, I don't know. Let's, we're not using the Tycos. No, I don't want anything standard. I want something really odd, weird, and different. 
you know what I mean, groove wise and sound wise and the way we're going to morph. And, and so it became a really, really, really cool thing that I had no idea it was going to go that way. And so that's the, so there's about the electronics. Okay. Now, so, so, but in the bigger picture, yeah, you know what? It's not going away, man. It's not going to ever go away now because if you were to do that, okay, so let's back up. I would say six, eight years now. I don't even, I've lost track. I did some product with some, with a friend of mine. Um, we created these loops. We, we recorded in my studio and it was just percussion, just me. And uh, for this company called Big Fish Audio. So I don't know if you're familiar with that. Those, Kalani, I know you are. Um, so, um, and what we did was we took, I don't know, I forget how much time we took to record these grooves. And then I overdubbed and I overdubbed and I overdubbed. It's all acoustic. There's no electronics whatsoever. The electronic part of it comes into play. When you buy this loop, these loops, you then could then go into your computer, fly that in and go like, now you don't get the whole piece that I, that I wrote. You don't get that. Now you could then put all these parts back together and make it. But, um, but anyway, but let's say, you know, I played this piece with four, five, six, eight, ten 10 layers of instruments and you go, Hey man, I love that djembe part. So now you just get, you take the stem of that, use that as a rhythm base, say, and then you start composing and add another, your own stuff around it. Right. That's the point of these type loop layers, loop layers. And that's where the electronics come in. Cause now it's in your computer. All right. So I'm doing a session app and I had Facebook was early on for me at that point. Or I think it was early on for, I don't even know how long Facebook around, been around now, which I kind of don't like. I don't like social media all that much, to be honest with you, but we're stuck with it. So, um, uh, but anyway, so I saw, and I had posted something about, hey, so honored to, to you know, to be, have, a, have a product release with my name on it, you know, like, wow, this is cool, you know, and oh boy. That did not go over too well in this in my in my circles in this town. <laughs> so I'm at a session, and we're and I'm principal percussion on it. So there's timpani and percussion, and there was no drum set. If there if there was, I would have been in the booth at whatever playing it. But anyway, so it was me and I think there were four or five of us total on this on this movie date, and uh, we're just literally just getting ready to start to record. And uh, it's about 15 minutes away. And one of the guys comes up to me. He says, hey, man, so what, I got to ask you a question, man. You know, like, what about this sample library you did? I go, what? And he goes, yeah. I mean, I saw this thing you posted about this library. I said, I, it's not a sample library. It's a loop library. Do you know what the difference is? And obviously he didn't. But, um, but I go, dude. Uh, and basically, he, pardon my English again, he was giving me shit for doing this because um, he, he then it got to like, well, how, how could, dude, how could you spend all this time and energy and years collecting your instruments? How could you sample them and let somebody have them? And I'm going like, well, I didn't sample them. They're not, it's not a sample library. It's a loop library. You get to use something that I did in your compositional product. And I said, look around this room, man. You know, we are very fortunate to be here. We were at Warner Brothers at that time on this stage, recording an orchestra or recording anything for that matter. And I said, but there are plenty of people around the country who are never going to be here. That's not going to happen. But does that delegitimize their compositional process? Shouldn't they have access to, you know, anything that they can get their hands on to help them in their compositional? And look, let's face it, a lot of these people around the world, you know, like might fancy themselves as composers, not anything close to it, but so what? what why shouldn't they have the opportunity to be able to have sample, if you want to even get deeper into sample libraries, at their fingertips, man? What's why? Why can't somebody who is never going to afford be able to come to Los Angeles or New York or London or wherever and record an orchestra on a big stage? Why shouldn't they be able to conceive music on their own and do what they want with it? You know, I, I just don't understand that concept, man. That's like limiting. And if you want to put the, a limit on it and put the kibosh on it, well, then good luck with that, because you better just eliminate computers. Right. That's never going to happen. So 
that was my argument, but you know, it still didn't go too well. <laughs> but I think but everybody's was... got their own attitude about this whole sample thing and loop library yeah. and all this kind of stuff. And you know what? I think there's there's a lot of uh, if I could just tack on this idea that you know, David David brought up an interesting interesting question, which is like, you know, what was the effect or how how do we as percussionists feel? And I think you're right, MB. There, there's opportunities and then some people felt it was a threat and i think the initial reaction is oh my god it it sounds like me it sounds like what i do but here's the thing we know now after you know 35 40 years that yeah in the 80s sure and then into the 90s um there was a drum machine craze and that and but that, that's over now i mean it you is. don't and and if you and you can look at any series any big uh budget movie date yeah, there's some synths on it, maybe, but it's all live players now. There's nobody doing. If you do a movie score and you're using even loops, um, it sounds like it, and it doesn't sound like you know the major movies. And, and maybe if unless they want that as an effect, I was going to say it's not a replacement. Yeah, yeah, it hasn't replaced live players. It hasn't replaced drummers or percussionists. It's it's got its own space, and it is an effect, um, but. But yeah, you don't hear any movie scores made on GarageBand, you know, <laughs> unless it's just a, you know, a, a low budget thing. So I agree with you, MB. I think it's good. It's it it democratizes music making and composing in a lot of ways. It gives just, people yeah. access to things they normally wouldn't have access to. And that's fine. I mean, and that that opens up, a you know, a, a bit of a can of worms in terms of like from the union's point of view, which unfortunately in this country, the union hasn't embraced yet. Um um, us as musicians on a union contract to do library music and production music and all this stuff. And it's unfortunate and sample libraries. Um, it's unfortunate, you know, um, because, you know, but I'm, I'm outnumbered at this point in my attitude about that, but I, I don't mind talking about it. And I don't care who hears this because um, I think it's unfortunate, man, there should be a contract for this and we would be working a lot more and it would not jeopardize in any way, shape or form form our involvement in real, I say, not that that's not real, but um, uh, union movie sessions and TV dates, because right now TV sessions, they're happening. And there's, to be honest with you, less of what I do on those, they will use samples for that because they, they, their time gets limited but they're using live strings. I will tell you that for sure on a lot of shows, live strings, you know, for sure. maybe woodwinds and brass too, but you know, but so we all get, you know, and I just did, there's a, a TV show called funk Kung Fu that a friend of mine's doing the music for. And I just did two days of sessions for her with all my stuff that will, this is a different concept now. Okay. But, but it, it was, it's union. And we just played for two days. In fact, I was hurting, man, after six and a half hours or six hours of playing each day. I mean, because it was a lot of tight, a lot of, you know, heavy sticks and, and, and a lot of playing. I think we, we created like 45 pieces. Okay. Mm. Now, what she's going to do is this thing that we just talked about before. She's going to take some of these things, elements that I recorded, Cut them up, loop them, but da, 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 and those will now on her tight timeline as the shows now she writes in the weeks to come. Um, she would not have the opportunity or the time to go like, hey, MB, I, I got to do a session and I need this done. She can't do that every week. It's she's got to write this stuff now and get it done. Time crunch. So now she can take this information that I used, fly it into her sessions each week. And I get paid again. I get paid as if it was a session. There's, it's totally legit. It's union. If everybody would start adopting that part, that that uh, attitude about this, and not be so afraid of like, oh, well, we recorded that, and so now we got to get residuals on this. And I mean, yeah, it's a big deal in the movies, but you don't get residuals that much in TV. You get some, but but that's not the point. The point is to play music, man, and to be able to get this out to everybody anywhere in any way, shape and form. And it, it, so some of the attitudes have to change. Hopefully they will someday, but that's the union side of it. But anyway, I'm wondering if uh, there'll be a time now, our generation, you know, the people that are hit, working over the last 20, 30 years, we did take a big hit 
it from machines and also from MP3s. We know that as an industry, as an industry, uh, from 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 the ability for people to digitally copy things and distribute mm -hmm. them all over the internet. We did, unfortunately, we took a hit. But here's the good news: is maybe now with things like uh, non fungible tokens, NFTs, we could presumably and here's a here's a cool vision that we could we could have for people like UMB and people like me that that do record at home and and create things for people. What if there was a, a situation where you recorded your all the stuff? Let's say, take the loop library idea, right? You record all these loops, you record sounds, then you sell them as NFTs. People can buy them. They can buy what they want. They can use it. And when it gets used, that's all on the blockchain. That's all tracked. And if somebody uses it or they want to resell it, you still get paid because it's all oh, beautiful, it's man. all tracked. So anytime somebody uses your loop in their piece, you get paid. Anytime they sell it to somebody else, you get paid. Anytime, you know, I love models like that and it's all automatic and it's all direct to consumer. Dude, we we, we got to talk about that because that's a whole level. I, I, I know about this stuff and I understand it a little bit, but it's deep and uh, you know, there's some levels and work involved in it but i'd love to talk to you more about that that's yeah i think that's yeah. a great idea yeah i i think it can happen i think it yeah. can happen you know yeah. with with blockchain so i don't know i don't know that much about it maybe mark knows more or maybe david, david knows oh. more about that stuff but, but but here's the thing here's the thing um you know there's one other element i wanted to talk mention david you were talking about like so electronics affecting so in my case i've been involved in fact you know early on i'm talking about 25 at least 25 years ago you know when like drummers and percussionists were actually showing up to a recording session with their own rack of electronic gear their own <laughs> processing and all this dude remember that so remember and then, had drum cats and mallet cats and mallet cats and a rack of gear and like you're processing your own stuff going in they don't do that anymore right it's too time consuming and it was expensive to have done on the scoring stage but there was a period of time when all the keyboard players in town and drummers drummers and, and one or two percussions had racks of electronic gear literally the equivalent of a recording studio dude yeah, that was yeah. all in rolling cases comes in gets all set up and with the orchestra yeah and then they're creating synth sounds and stuff to go at on that date and then the orchestra sometimes would have to sit there while a guy is patching up a, pulling up a patch talk <laughs> about wasting money and time so they don't do that anymore that's all done in advance and then they either whatever so um so, so funny, that kind of went by the wayside so <laughs> it's this morphing thing but then there's the next level okay and this is the level that that i i'm a little uh, i have my issues about which is ai because there's a mm -hmm. whole way you know you can do you can create music now with no with no humans mm -hmm. and i'm sorry man i can't do that that's not that's not <laughs> happening for me yeah i got this is a very physical thing playing music that'd be like saying like oh well, we're just not gonna have dancers anymore we'll just have you know computers we we'll just look at it on a computer screen and watch watch visuals of that what you know like no aren't there are concerts now though aren't there concerts that are performed by anima it's a it's a screen right it's like a computer generated artist yeah. right there are it, it exists already i know this whole thing and i'm sorry I, that i can't hang with man i just can't hang with that it's yeah. like no to me this is a very visceral thing and that's what it's going to be until the day I'm not on this planet for me. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm not, I, Hey, it's going to, it's going to happen. AI it's already happening. Um, is it musical or not? I can't even answer that, but I'm not interested. I don't even want to talk about it really honest with you because I want, I want to hear and see live musicians. I yeah. want to hear that. I want to be in that environment, whether I'm actually playing or not, or whether it's a concert. I don't want to go to a concert and just watch a quick, quick question for you. What do you think of what any house music DJ does? Who's doing live looping, right? Not yes. live looping in the, in the Kalani sense where everything's recorded. But what he's doing is taking a bunch of loops well, and improvising that, yes. That well, it's it's like that guy that I told you that I work with in this movie. He's a beat DJ beat maker, right? And he's yeah. like re plugging and so that's still even though it's samples and even though it's whatever, he's creating on the spot. So I'm cool with that. 
Yeah, I did. I was like I said, I had a little bit of an attitude about it at first. Um, when I came around, when he was like, "Whoa, this dude, this guy's heavy," because he's got a freaking cool sense of time and coming up with stuff that I wouldn't think of because physically, you go like, "I just it just wouldn't be a natural thing." But when you're when you're just creating rhythm, and you go like, "Oh, well," I, sometimes we would be playing. I'm going like, "Shit, where's the talk about where's the downbeat?" Sometimes I would like, uh, "What's happening here?" So you just go with it. And it was mm-hmm. awesome. It was really fun. So I'm I can hang with that, but you know, at some point, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I wouldn't. Again, I would I would if I'm going to go to a concert because I actually have been. I, I've taken my daughter's now out of college, but uh, when she was in high school, early college, I took her a couple of times to the Life Is Beautiful Festival in Las Vegas, which we went to the very first one, which was really cool, and we went to have four or five different stages or whatever. And one of the stages was an indoor tent because they needed to project light show um, with these DJ. Oh my God. And at first you go like, uh, okay, I can't enough of that. Whatever. But then if you just kind of immerse yourself into it, man, it was pretty cool. The people who were really good at it because they were, they were, creating it wasn't like oh here's something i recorded at home just hit a play button stand there light show you know what i mean no no they were morphing stuff and doing and really making it happen so so there's so much of that stuff like that that i uh, i love and there's plenty of it but you can take that with any kind of music i don't care whether it's humanly created or electronic there's a lot of great stuff out there and there's a lot of stuff that's not so great so you know who was it was it miles davis or john cole somebody plenty of people have said hey man Good music is good music. End of story. It doesn't make any difference. What you you can classify it however you want. It doesn't make any difference at that point. It's good or it's bad. It's going to move you or it's not. And at that point, it's only at the end of the day, it's not an objective objective thing. You can analyze it upside down all day long. You want it doesn't make any difference. It's a very subjective thing. It works for you or it doesn't. I like a lot of kinds of music that plenty of people I know, friends of mine will never listen to. They just think it sucks. You know what I mean? And my, and my wife, I mean, she doesn't like a lot of the music that I play. She's not a jazz fan, but she, she'll come hear me play or she'll listen to it and she, she, she can appreciate it, but that's not her go-to music, you know? And she definitely could not wrap her head around the, the whole avant-garde 20th century stuff that I, you know, like when I was, did when I was in college or that I've done a little bit of since then is not her jam. You know, she's like a Jackson Brown, you know, she's a song tune oriented kind of person and that's her thing. So everybody likes different stuff, man. You know, my kids and I like a lot of the same kind of music. Oh, like there's this band out of uh, uh, Australia called Hiatus Cody, a coyote crazy awesome band and there's so see here's another thing there's so much great music man that people like to particularly in all over i don't know how old everybody is here but i'm I'm probably older than anybody but um but uh like to complain about like how music sucks today well then you know what i don't know what to tell you because there's a yeah some music sucked but plenty of it sucked in the 80s So you're going to tell me you like the music of the, yeah, I like some music in the eighties and I hated most of it. You know what I mean? But that was only because of the music we got exposed to, but now like Spotify or not, we can get exposed to so much more that we never had the access to before. So I don't like Spotify on so many levels because the artists don't make what they should be making. And on the other hand, we get exposed to a ton of music that would never happen. And guess what? As an artist, if David or Mark or any of us uh, wanted to release your own music, you could not do that 20 years ago. Right. And now you can you can go, hey, I got a piece of music. I'm going to put it up on Spotify or I'm going to put it up on um, uh, 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 Apple, you know, or whatever, whatever. You can sell that. You could not do that 20 years ago. If you did not have a record company deal, you had nothing or a rec- or somebody backing you. It was not going to happen. Well, you, you're just doing the club circuit, maybe whatever, but you're not going to get a tour. You're not going to sell records unless you sold them yourself. You're not going to get airplay. You're not going to get any of that. It's a different deal now. So, so there's pluses and minuses for all this stuff, you know, at this point. So I think 
we're stuck with what it is. And I think the only way around it or to deal with it is to deal with it and go like, how can we make this work for us? Kalani just talked about, you know, uh, uh, the non fudge uh, NFTs or, you know, whatever there's, Hey, there's going to be new models coming out all the time. And there's, that's a great reason to keep creating and keep doing what we do. Also, you know? yeah, exactly. Absolutely. And I think it's on the artists and creators to connect with their, the consumer or the fan, um, the end user. And I got to say also that even though, um, you know, I'm on Patreon now, this is a, this is happening, uh, because of the Patreon site. And even though page, the Patreon situation isn't perfect as a middleman or as a, they're a facilitator, right. Of yeah. it's crowd, crowdfunding, crowdsourcing. And I got to say, as somebody that's published a lot. I've self-published uh, videos. I started making my own videos. Then I made my own DVDs and I did all the artwork and sold them. And But I still had to have distributors. And I got to tell you guys, as much as it's great to have distributors, I also got left holding the bag a few times with distributors that that decided to go bankrupt or they, you know, they just disappeared. Some guy just would disappear, owing me thousands of dollars. And I got to say that being able, being able to have something like Patreon where I can create People directly consume it straight from me and they support what I do. So it's a direct relationship is so much of a, re uh, it's a relief in a lot of ways because then people who, people who value it can ship in a little, they end up paying way less than they would have paid if it, if they had bought like all the DVDs, for example, right. which would have been hundreds of dollars um or even connect with private lessons it would have been way more so it's i think it's better for everyone i'm i am excited about what nfts could hold for the future but but you're right mb like now um spotify you know artists get exposed and it, then it's up to them to follow up it's up to them to connect with their fans right and maybe do a crowdfunding or crowdsource thing you know and and create more of a direct relationship with the with the right your fans yeah i mean i'm in this situation with this band with opium moon i mean you know like my joke with this band is like well <laughs> a couple things you know I, I mentioned before at the beginning of this like i wanted to be in the beatles well i wouldn't say that opium moon is the beatles but it's my Beatles. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. all these years later, I've had this long career and now I'm in this band. <laughs> it's like, what? You what? made it. <laughs> and won a Grammy. I mean, it's like crazy to me. You know, like, and not only that, but I'm in this band who I happen to think is pretty amazing. Now, the business side of stuff, ugh, I, uh, the music business, that's a whole nother conversation. We won't start that right now. But <laughs> Um, uh, that's not my forte and that's not my jam. I want to just play. And so when we play, it's magical all the time. And that's what I love about being in this band. Uh, the business side of it, yeah, it's tough, you know, but so we play, but anyway, I've been in this band five and a half years. We do nothing but spend money. We've not made a dime. And I got a, and I got a freaking Grammy. And that's just, I tell my friends in business this, and they look at me like I'm out of my mind. You know, they go like, dude, how, what? First of all, why would you do that? And secondly, how is that even possible? And I'm going <laughs> like, I don't know. It's just the way that it is. So, you know, we still got a learning curve. We've got to learn a lot to learn about like how uh, what you were talking about, Kalani, of like, oh, our own. How do we now promote what we have and what we've done? It's all self-marketing at that point. And this is another thing that if you're not good at something, then you got to pull people in to help you do that. You know what I mean? Whether it's the, like I, like one of the girls, I mentioned this, this band, the jazz blues review that I play with. Um, one of the, the singers, are, they all have their own careers too. And um, I was talking to one of the girls and they're all amazing singers. I mean, if you ever get a chance to hear, they're on YouTube and stuff. It's called the George Kahn jazz blues review. You'll hear these girls they are amazing. And one of them uh, just, she, we were talking about the social media stuff the other day. And she goes, I, I just, I, I can't, I hate it. I just hate it. So she hires, now she's in the position she could do that, but uh, to at least a little degree, because it's not super expensive, but she has somebody do her social media for her because she's not going to do it. Yeah. It's just not going to happen. And you got to look at like, now and here's somebody who I totally love and he does do some of his, I mean, in terms of the technical stuff, maybe somebody else does it, but it, The Rock. Okay. I love that guy. I freaking love that guy. I love everything about him his message, his work ethic, just everything about him. 
and 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 the fact that he's bald and, <laughs> and uh, i don't know i mean the fact that he's as buff is i don't know if i'd want to be that buff but whatever yeah. but anyway uh, i love that dude and and he you know he's always here's me in the gym here's me in this and he's doing that but then somebody else takes it and takes care i know i know he's not spending as much time as he needs to post and all that stuff so he's got us and he could certainly afford on any level a social media person right so that's so there's that but anyway we're all in this position now that was again never happened in the past where it's like we can we have the opportunity to do something that we could not do before right but it means us having to wear a hat and kalani you've done it all man you've done your artwork you've done all these computer stuff you've done that 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 right the list of having to self-produce yourself is endless and you've had to do all this stuff don't you have didn't you just hit a hundred thousand subscribers on world drum club uh we just hit two hundred thousand on youtube oh, yeah on the YouTube. this is fantastic that's you insane that man yourself, right? that's I mean, awesome dude the whole social media presence that's that's, that's retirement awesome. for me if i could have two hundred thousand subscribers you know, on I, youtube apparently yeah. there's 35 million youtube uh channels now and yeah I, did, I was surprised to hear it was that many, but it's like 35 million. But uh, I guess, yeah, less than 1% or over 100,000. Yeah, it's hard now. Magic. It's, it's harder now than it was. I started World Drum Club like seven years ago, not knowing, you know, pandemic or whatever, not not having any idea. Um, but I think now it's harder. I started an ukulele club channel a year and a half ago, and I'm like at 400 subscribers. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's... Uh, it's it's a lot harder now to break in and to get it. You got to really treat it like a business and everybody's yeah. more savvy and everybody's right. got optimization things they're doing and it's just very competitive. But but then that's business. That's life. That's business. That's it's business. Know. And here's another thing. OK, oh, now, uh, David, I don't know if this ties in. Did I, by the way, David, I, I know I rambled a bit. Did I answer even <laughs> get close to answering your question? <laughs> <laughs> and beyond. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Thank you. Uh, but here's another thing that I that I mention in my seminars um, when I when I work with composers. Okay. Well, drummers and percussionists too. But I end up doing a lot of percussion seminars for com film composers, right? USC, Berkeley School of Music. I mean, I've done a, a bunch of these, and I do USC on a regular basis. And um, one of the things I'll talk about, which like in my rambling style, I'll get off the subject and talk about anything almost sometimes besides percussion but i think it's important which is none of us now i don't know what any what your guys mark and david your educational background is but i can speak about mine which is and i mentioned it before but uh with inside that i never learned anything about law now i did take some psychology classes but i never learned anything about law right uh, on any level and um I highly recommend to everyone now, because at the end of the day, we're all entrepreneurs. We're self-owned. We're owners of our own business, right? Which is not the way we're educated, which is not the way we're taught, right? We've had to learn this. What Kalani, what you've done, you've had to learn that on your own, man, since day one. Same thing here. Mark, day, you know, on anything that we all do, we've had to learn all this on our own day since day one. Um, and it's unfortunate that we're not taught a little bit more. I don't come from a, my family, it was, my family weren't in the, in any business. So I couldn't get, learn a business sense. I had to develop it. Right. And I still have a lot to learn about that. But when I do my seminars, I tell people, look, man, you got to do yourself a couple favors. You need to take at least one or two business classes on how just some basic business understanding uh, you need to, um, if you can take, if you're in college and you can take an entrepreneurial class, whatever would get covered in that, great. If not, you got to do it on your own. And definitely take a contract law class or learn something about it somewhere from somebody or some books or whatever. And definitely take some psychology classes because at the end of the day, if, at least in, in this world now, let alone the microcosm of this business, um, there's a lot of crazy people. And, you know, how do you deal with them? How do we deal with them to and still be able to do what we do? 
you know, and it, like, and I speak it to it at, to with composers from a point of view of like they're going to come out of school, they're not going to have they're 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 uh, they're they're not going to get their first big break on a union movie or TV show. It's going to be non-union, and it's going to be how do you, but yet the people hiring you want to hear a John Williams score. Well, how are you going to perform that when they're giving you maybe if you're lucky five grand or ten grand to do a score like that? That's not going to happen. So how do you do it? Right. So you got all these parameters you got to deal with financially. And then you're also dealing with people who know nothing about music in general. Some do. Seth, Seth McFarland, who happens to be one of the biggest in the industry, probably the biggest in the industry, because he himself is a musician. I just work not me directly with him, but I was I played on some epi uh, episode of Orville about a month ago now. And we did three days of recording sessions for one episode for TV. That's that does not happen, man. But it will with Seth McFarlane because he makes so much money for Fox that he's going to say jump and they're going to say how high. And that's rare. Usually it's the other way around. Usually it's the production company is telling them what's the way it's going to be. And that's the way it's going to be. But he's in a he's in a completely different league. So um, so he can pull something like that off. Um, so how do you deal with people like that? You know, I mean, how, like the producers or the, or the production company, right? All of these things, you're not taught that in school. We're never taught any of this. And like, okay. And yeah, when you get out, you're going to be dealing with this schmuck conductor or this person who's from a production company who thinks they know about music, but they really don't know anything about music at the bottom line to them is the dollar sign. So there's so much of this stuff that is all part of all carts all on any level all part of our culture and then let's take it to the next level of like well what about okay now you start making some money now how do you retain that money so you're not broke at the end of your career you know there's so much to learn we're not taught that in school man and if you can't learn it in school we need to learn it somewhere because otherwise we're all going to be left in the dust you know and 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 there's so much on all these levels. And then again, back to the product, all the levels of production. Like if you want to do your videos and release your records and blah, 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 do your clinics and workshops and, you know, then do gigs. And it's a lot to, it's a lot to manage, man, and maintain. So you got to, you got to wear a, you know, who was really great at that, by the way, was um, early on, and this is going back many years, was Kenny G. Now people can say what they want about Kenny G. I have the utmost respect for that guy. Um, I'm not necessarily, I know Pat Metheny doesn't agree with that, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, cause he, he did an expose when Kenny, well, it was pretty ballsy when Kenny did that video where it was him and superimposed was Nat King Cole or it was Nat King Cole. Oh no, no. Satchmo. And, um, and that was it. Pat Metheny couldn't hold himself back on that one. He had to rail on it. But despite that, uh, yeah. Kenny, does what Kenny does, but he's got a really great business head and he can, he was able in his career to sell up, to separate the boat, but he comes from a family of business background, right? They were early investors in Starbucks. He's probably made and lost more money in Starbucks than we may make in our careers. So, you know, whatever, but you see what I'm saying? So there's so many levels of all this stuff that we need to know and learn. And we don't learn it when we're growing up. And most of us don't. So I think it's all part of the package too. Anyway, that's my little expose on. <laughs> on Absolutely. That. So well, that's great advice. So I think we will leave it there, you guys. Okay. I, I really appreciate everybody joining today. And yeah, thank yeah, you. Thanks nice you to see you guys. Yeah, you too. Thanks, Envy. I really, you've been so generous with your time and just all the great stories and advice and life lessons. And yeah, thanks uh, everybody that that tuned this in. And, and if yeah, and if you're watching. Make sure if you're watching later on YouTube, you know, you just leave uh, your nice, kind and helpful comments in the comment section. And if you want to uh, contact MB, MB, where's the best place for people to, uh, to follow you or connect with you? OK, so uh, my website is is MB, www.mbgordiatmac.com. I mean, www.mbgordy.com. My email, I've got two. So you can hit me up on MB at mbgordy.com. Should I, it would be better for me to type it into the thing or, or mbgordy at mac.com. Those are the two emails. Okay. I think those are fine. Yeah. I think people can get that. Okay. Um, um, awesome. So, 
Yeah, I, you know, and seriously, if you ever have just a question or you want to talk about some stuff, you know, hit me up and uh, I'm happy to to give whatever advice or share or talk about gear or talk about whatever we need because we didn't really talk about a whole lot of gear stuff. But um, <laughs> <laughs> next but time. So you could spend, you know, how much time you want to spend on that. <laughs> but, well, I want to get you over to my little studio here because we're local, you know, and come over and we'll talk gear. Maybe we'll make a video for World Drum Club. And I would you know, love see that. What happens. I would do love some that. playing. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, let's we'll let's get past. Hey, and Kalani, I'll let you know, too. Um, well, let's see, Mark, you're on the East Coast. David, you're in Austin. Uh, I know a bunch of people in Austin now, but um uh, but uh, anyway, I've got some things coming up, some some different kind of performances happening here in L.A. coming up. I'll let you know, Kalani, in case you want to check something out, if you're available, if you're in town, you know, whatever. But um, and then let's see if there's anything else I need. Oh, and then and then as far as the Opium Moon, you can uh, that band you can see um, we're on, we've got, you know, a YouTube thing. We've got uh, it's opiummoon.com, which is the website. And um and then we're on Spotify, the, the record, everything's on Spotify. So some separate sort of single releases, plus the record that we, our first record, which won the Grammy. And then now the second one, which is a double record, uh, which uh, I happen to really love this record. Um, and it's kind of weird. I'm, I'm, I tell people as a joke, and it's, but I'm serious. I'm probably the biggest critic of my own band, <laughs> like on it pretty much every level. And, um, but this record is really good. So, um, so it's, it's fun. Anyway, it's a double record. So there's kind of the up stuff and then the more, again, meditative, sensual, whatever downside. And that's on Spotify as well, or Bandcamp if you want to buy it. And um, what else? And that's it. So yeah, thank you guys. I really appreciate thank you. the opportunity, Kalani. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Really awesome. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you. Kalani, Thank you. Kalani, we'll, we'll, we'll talk, man. I, I, would be, I can't wait to see you, man. It's in person. That would be great. Likewise. Likewise. All, All right. right man. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for Thank tuning you. in. Have a great day. Bye-bye. See you next time. Bye-bye.